Hello everyone again. Is this so oh, lovely? Well, I've learned something about myself today. I've learned something from the Prime Minister, Richie Sunak, and I've learned something from the Daily Express, and I've learned something from the Daily Mail this morning. I tend to avoid looking at these papers, but I've learned that I'm a terrorist, I'm an extremist, I'm a threat to public order. Uh, and I'm a threat to democracy and the very fabric of our society. I never knew that. It's a remarkable, isn't it? I'm a di oh, and I'm of course I cause divisions in society. Oh, I don't know if you can cope with all this now this morning. So, um, let's put my glasses on. I just wanted to talk about two who I regard as heroes in the last uh, few days. The firstly is the desperately sad case of Aaron Bushnell, a 25-year-old young serviceman in the US Air Force who set himself on fire in an ultimate act of protest against the mass slaughter of civilians in Gaza. This took place outside the Israeli embassy in Washington DC last Sunday as the flames engulfed him, his final words were free Palestine. A, it's terrible. Apparently he woke up one morning and happy about what is um, his part of in, in the services and he wanted to do something about it. He was calm all through his protests and up to his final moments of course. As expected, some in the media tried to make out he was mentally ill. In other words, that he did not have a valid reason to commit this act. Personally, I don't think he was mentally ill, and to a tiny, minuscule extent, I can understand his actions. Often I have felt helpless and full of despair, as I'm sure you all have, and even found myself thinking I didn't want to be in a world where such evil was taking place and allowed to take place. Like Norman Finkelstein recently said, we're screaming inside. I don't want the death of this man to have been in vain. I want the end of this nightmare when it comes. Please, God, let it be soon to be in some part Aaron Bushnell's legacy. I was very touched by Hamas's moving tribute to him, saying that he would, and I quote, remain immortal in the memory of the Palestinian people. His death has had an effect on me. I'm no longer as afraid to speak out for the Palestinians and to call out the Israeli Zionists for what they actually are. Nothing more than common criminals, murderous, land-thieving gangsters who should be arrested and put on trial like other thieves and murderers, along with their accomplices and backers, principally Biden, Sunak, Starmer and Schultz. Shame on them all! I was going to suggest a minute's silence, but I think we can all have a few thoughts about Aaron Bushnell during today. My second hero is another young man, I don't know how many of you will have listened to him, a lawyer who spoke at The Hague for the ICJ. He's a prosecutor for the Arab League by the name of Professor Ralph Wild. Yeah, you, an expert in international humanitarian law. He delivered a most brilliant speech, which has gone viral, of the Israeli Zionist colonist project in Palestine from before the First World War to the present day. He lists their crimes and how these crimes are being shielded primarily by the US and also by the likes of UK and Germany. His speech is the most subtly damning destruction of every excuse Israel has ever made to be doing what they are doing in Gaza that you have ever heard and it should be and it will be studied and poured over for decades to come and beyond of that I'm sure try and catch it if you haven't listened to him so a conclusion which was too long that I intended again so to conclude I believe that these two young men have both made a huge impact in totally different ways on the thinking about the horrors in Gaza but also on the wider picture 
I no longer believe in a two-state solution. I share the view of the Orthodox Jewish people and their rabbis like Weiss, Feldman and Beck that the whole state of Israel is a crime, that's their words, and must be dismantled and returned to the indigenous people, namely the Palestinians, and for all people, Jews, Arabs and Christians, to live freely in the land from the river to the sea as they did for centuries. But I also believe that the overwhelming global outpouring of support for the Palestinians and condemnation of Israel's actions have been a great a game changer. I'm sure Netanyahu and Biden and the rest of the criminals banked on people like us becoming fed up and desensitized and that the huge demonstrations would fizzle out. Never. Never. No, they've made a great mistake because the opposite is happening. The rallies are becoming longer and more intense. There are now signs that the aforementioned criminals are beginning to crack because our determination to get justice and peace for the Palestinians will never crack. Thank you everyone. Free Palestine. So much. Anybody else? Raise your hand. Remember Aaron Bushnell! Remember Aaron Bushnell! He's not alone! He's not alone! Remember Aaron Bushnell! Remember Aaron Bushnell! He's not alone! He's not alone! I've learned very much Germany that has been made, if Germany wasn't made, Adolf Hitler wouldn't have made the Holocaust, and then, and then, in, uh, wait, what? If Germany wasn't made, Adolf Hitler wouldn't have made the Holocaust against Jews, and then the Jews wouldn't have immigrated to Palestine, and they wouldn't have made a country. Very, very bad. <laughs> no, no borders, maybe. <laughs> She'd like to. Hi, guys. I'm Sundas. Hi. <laughs> How are you guys today? <laughs> Thank you all for being here. So I'm going to read you guys a few poems. And the first one, I've read it a couple of times. But I will continue to read it because for me, it really captures the essence of everything that is going on and it's called the betrayal of our hospitality. They say don't bite the hand that feeds you, but they didn't just bite it. They sunk their teeth in and tore it apart, dismembered it, took away its ability to even feed itself. They decided that wasn't enough. An arm, a leg, another limb, one hand soon turned into hundreds, then thousands, then millions. Rough hands, soft hands, wrinkled hands, and even those that are small, delicate and fragile. We were betrayed. So I'm sure you're all aware what happened in the Super Bowl. So the next poem is about that. They told us sports is not the place for politics. They said it's for us to forget our worries and enjoy our days. And as they distracted you with extravagant performances at half time, they slaughtered our people. As they blew you away with flares and fireworks, a little girl's limbs were blown off. They drape more decorations and dangle more lights so the twinkles blind you, while on the other side, a little girl's guts are draped and dangling off a wall. A wall of a family house that once radiated with love. Oh, how the decorations differ. Now they'll play you some adverts about family and love, as they try and justify why they're sending our people up above. The explosions in their skies are pretty and bring a smile to everyone's face. Yet the explosions in our skies are an attempt to wipe out our race. They draw streaks of red on their faces to show support to their teams. Yet the streaks of red on our children are a notion of murdered dreams. There's nothing super about this Super Bowl. Strike has developed a new meaning, but that won't stop them from celebrating. The cheers mask our children's screams. Thanks guys. And um, the next poem, I'm sure you've all seen what's happened with the flower massacre. So it's kind of based on that and kind of the lack of access to clean water. Let me teach you a recipe. It's a recipe for cookies, 
But unfortunately, I can't guarantee that it'll warm the hearts of the likes of you and me. First, you mix flour with plenty and plenty of blood. Then instead of chocolate, you add water filled with mud. Chocolate chips, more like bits and bits of all our people, the Nakba sequel. But this one's more evil because it's broadcasted on every social media. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> um, see, it's like, um, I forgot her name, but she, see, Cinder. She was very brave and read her poems. So I feel a bit of bravery and I'm gonna, so tonight I'm gonna read this piece um, at the Scala, um, up north a little bit. Um, and this is a piece that was commissioned to me um, as an Italian Palestinian woman. This is just the end, because I can't read it all, it's very long. Um, and it goes like that. It has been almost five months now. Every day is worse than the day before. Actually, it's five months now. So this is written a bit of a, you know, a couple of weeks ago. So it has been five months now. Every day is worse than the day before. Only a week ago, the picture of the body of a child hanging dismembered from the wall of their bombed house, hunting people's social media feed. No head, her little arm keeping it there as on the verge of a precipice. The small legs had no feet but ended in ribbons of flesh like a paper doll. It was found out that the body was of a 12 years old girl, Sidra, her name. That night I had the worst nightmare I have had so far. I was in Gaza with my partner trying to find a place to shelter from the constant bombing when we heard the sounds of tanks and boots. The army was closing in, they were ready for a mopping up. We tried to hide under pieces of cardboard, but they found us. They herded us into barracks and they stripped us naked, like the picture of Hamza, the man taken prisoner and tied to a chair, but still defiant. The soldiers were pushing needles through our fingers, from the soft flesh of our fingertips all the way through the nails. The pain was unbearable. The pain I felt on my own hands and the pain of the scream of my partner being tortured to. I woke up drenched in sweat, barely breathing. My hair was so wet it stuck to my forehead. I had to take my pyjama off, soaked as if I had a showered. I felt relief when I realized it was just a nightmare. A second of, re of relief before guilt. The nightmare, I could wake up from it. My people in Gaza and in the West Bank cannot. The unbearable pain I live vicariously in my nightmare is their pain. The trauma seeping through images of their death day after day. While our bodies are broken over there, our souls are broken here in guilt and powerlessness. We look at our people in Gaza for strength. They rely on us to keep fighting from the safety of our bodies. We need each other. We are one. And after what we have witnessed and lived through these months, we are never going to be the same ever again. People can stay silent, hoping this genocide will pass and leave them untouched. But they too are never going to be the same. They have already been touched. While our bodies and souls are in pieces, our ability to love is intact. Those who stay silent may still own a body and maybe a soul, but it's empty property, without any love. What I answer to people who ask me, why fight? Why hope is left anyway? I think about Dr. Rifat al being killed a few days after he wrote his poem. If I must die, you must leave, to tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of clothes and some string, make it white with a long tail, so that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dead, who left in a blaze, and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself, sees the kite, my kite you made, flying up above, and thinks for a moment an angel is there, bringing back love. If I must die, let it bring hope, let it be a tale. I read this poem and I feel deeply 
that what is happening now in Gaza and to my people can be the reason this world changes. And my people's courage, kindness and love can lead how it changes. I think about Palestinian poetry and Palestinian poets. I think about how words are used to dehumanize us and how we still find a way through our words to teach life. In the words of another Palestinian poet, Dr. Rifat Ziada, we teach life back to those who take life away from us. And what I really know is that Palestine and Palestinians are the poetry of this world. Hi everyone. I just want to share my story with. Um, I was talking to my eldest kids a couple of days ago um, about the the day-to-day -day activities in school, um, and they were moaning how they have to go to the bus, catch the bus half seven in the morning. So I said, here's about my childhood in Palestine. I'm from a city called Nablus, if you heard of it, in the West Bank. My parents were teachers in Saudi Arabia, so we went back in 1991 after the first Gulf War. Gulf War and my first ever school day at school, year six. I was so excited. I was welcomed by an Israeli soldier. Um, he grabbed me from the neck and dragged me for a few meters because he suspected I was uh, throwing stones on them. And that was the beginning of my school childhood, um, hearing uh, bullets every morning. I was a healthcare professional in, in um, Palestine, and I was one of the very, very few young men who were allowed to leave the city of Nablus in 2003. And the usual routine was out of the car, put your trousers down, and lift your shirt up. That's the normal day going to work. Okay. As a father, well, before going to father, I work as a healthcare professional here and I see patients in the surgeries and they come and talk about their trauma. And then that flares up my trauma every day. But guess what? I use my experience in Palestine to support these people. We are Palestinians. You are all Palestinians. We will never die. It's very emotional to see the mothers in Gaza. Obviously, my childhood, I'm a bit shameful of, of talking about it now, considering compared to the children of Gaza, what they're going through right now. I mean, nowadays, we used to have a rubber bullets. It bloody hurts, but they didn't kill. Nowadays, it's just aiming to kill children straight away. Talk, looking at the news and watching the mothers as a father, I cannot imagine the feeling of a mother saying the final goodbye or the final kiss or the final hug to their children. I cannot imagine a mother whose children are still buried under the buildings. She must be thinking, are they still alive? Are they cold? Are they hungry? Can you imagine those who are married or have partners saying the final goodbye to your partner? And just to remind you, the life in Palestine is different. If you and your partner go through this left, tough life in Palestine, you are very, you will have very strong relationship. So saying the final goodbye to your, to your partner is not the easy thing. I would like to thank the Welsh people to make me feel welcomed in Wales. You should be all proud to be Welsh. You should be all proud to be Palestinians. Free, free Palestine. Hi, hello everyone. Um, I won't be very long, I'm just here to talk on behalf of the Friends of Al-Aqsa campaign regarding the boycott. So check the label boycott, uh, especially regarding the dates. So if you don't know, um, dates make up a huge, huge part of the Israeli economy. And it is time that we use our economical power to boycott. We don't want to spend one penny into their genocidal um, ideal 
crazy mental ideal, whatever you want to call it. Um, so please make sure that you uh, check the label, make sure that you don't, don't get tricked because they are trying to trick us into like creating a different like kind of marketing, like Jordanian dates and like Arabic names and stuff. Don't be tricked. We can outsmart them because they're not that clever, but we can use our power and outsmart them. Um, just, I just came up with a very short chant and can we try it? Yeah. Try it? Right. So the campaign is called Check the Label. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna check the label, and you're gonna repeat. I'm Sorry, gonna time. check the label. No Israeli dates on my table. No Israeli dates on my table. Once again. No Israeli dates on my table. I'm gonna check the label. I'm gonna check the label. No Israeli dates on my table. No Israeli dates on my table. I'm gonna check the label. I'm gonna check the label. No Israeli dates on my table. No Israeli dates on my table. Thank you very much, and please come on the boycott. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, thank you so much. So be careful because sometimes uh, some dates, especially Medjool dates, are labeled as Palestinian one. And once again, that's a trick. So be very careful. There are a couple of these on. I'm gonna check the label. I'm gonna check the label. No Israeli dates on my table. No Israeli dates on my table. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good day. It's me again. Um, I just want to take this minute and I want, <laughs> I want everyone to really show appreciation to Charlotte Church. Ch Charlotte Church. There's a lot. There's, there's many people, many people that have big platforms and big followings and have spoken for Palestine, whether musicians, whether actors, whether politicians. And when the pressure has come on them, they've retracted, they've turned around, and they've apologized. Charlotte is standing firm for the Palestinian cause and that is something admirable and we all need to, to support her and to have her back on that. So, if you're not following her, if you're not following her on social media, Charlotte, 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 Charlotte. If you're not following her on social media, follow her on Instagram, The Real Charlotte Church, share the work that she's doing, share the things that she's doing and stand in solidarity with the people who are standing in solidarity and risking everything for the Palestinian cause. Sweetheart, thank you so much. Um, okay, so maybe we'll, we'll bring it to an end there. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you for uh, trying this new sharing circle protest thing. <laughs> and um, yeah, hopefully we can do it a couple more times and just get into the feelings of it and really help each other through this collective trauma um, that, that we're all experiencing. So huge love to you all. Thank you so much um, for, for coming out in the rain. Uh, my feet are soaking. <laughs> They're terrible shoes for a protest. I never learned. Um, and just, yeah, huge love to you all. Um, free, free Palestine. <laughs> One minute and um, I think it's really important today that when we look around um, we're obviously all thinking of the people of Palestine but I really want to say thank you to the faces here I don't know your names but we're the faces here who organize this every single week <laughs> There are organizers here, there are people that put their love and their time and their energy and their emotions and their stress into this every single week and I just
really would like to acknowledge that um, it, it's so important to do, and I, and I would really thank you, thank you so much for bringing everyone together. <laughs> I think I just think um, I, yeah, I just want to say thank you. I think everyone here, you see the same faces every single week, and I know that you've all got your own lives, you've all got your own things to think about and things to stress out about. And I think it's really amazing that you um, you bring everyone together. And every single week, I feel I leave here and I feel so motivated and so inspired and just really thankful. So, can we just have a round of applause for the organisers, please? Thank you. So, whoever you are, organizers, well done.